When I went to my first censor conference, I thought to myself, someday censors are going to revolutionize the world. Little did I know that someday would be sooner than later. Hi, I'm Amelia Dalton, host of Chalk Talk. Today, sensor technology has become an integral part of our everyday lives. And tomorrow, sensor technology will mean even more than it does today. In this episode of Chalk Talk, David Jones from Infineon and I are looking at the future of sensor technologies and how they are going to impact our lives in this post-pandemic world. We investigate how miniaturization, built-in antennas in package, and the evolution of radar technology have helped usher in a whole new era of sensing technologies, and how all of this, and more, will help us live healthier and happier lives. And before we get started, don't forget to click that link. There you can find even more information about this topic from Infineon. Hi, David. Thank you so much for joining me. Nice to be here. Thank you. Absolutely. Now, David, we're talking about sensing technologies in this post-pandemic world today. But before we get into the details, what do you think we have really learned specifically from COVID-19 in this arena? I think the biggest thing we've all learned is the word uh, pandemic and what that means to us moving forward. I think we've all got used to now the fact of wearing masks keeping social distancing, enforcing cleanliness rules in terms of sanitization, et cetera. But what's interesting, I think, as well, is that pandemics are not a new thing. They've been around for many, many years. I mean, you can trace the last true worldwide pandemic back to the Spanish flu in 1919. But in addition to that, there's been a whole slew of pandemics. We've had, um, in our lifetimes, we've had things like between 1957 and 58, there was a pandemic, the H2N2 virus. 68, there was also a pandemic, which was a version of that. And then there's influenza in 2009. If you were to Google the word pandemic or epidemic, there's many, many sites that talk about even many, many more issues in terms of outbreaks of viruses and pandemics, or well, not necessarily full pandemics, but academics that were centralized to a single country. And the list goes on and on. So this is certainly not a new thing. And I think going forward in the new world, I truly don't think this is truly going to go away anytime soon. If we've learned anything, it's this fact that these have been around for a long time. This is not necessarily new. And we're all trying to adjust to a, a new environment, a new work environment, a new social environment moving forward. That makes sense. Now, David, how do sensing technologies fit in this new post-pandemic world? So the sensing technologies that a lot of companies are developing now, including Infineon technology, is we're miniaturizing the sensor technologies. Things like radar, for example. I think a lot of people are familiar with radar airports, these big antennas spinning around to detect aircrafts on ships as well. Even devices to detect speed. You know, we don't like those, but they're in our environment. The technology of radar itself is shrunk down to almost the size of uh, an integrated circuit these days. And you can do the same for microphones. You can do the same for pressure sensors. You can do the same for other sensing technologies. So at Infineon, what we've done with our sensing technologies is basically now that we have that capability to shrink that down to a size where it's literally non-intrusive. So you can have sensor technologies that you can embed into multiple applications. We can essentially now replicate the human senses. So things like touch, you can almost replicate that in a machine environment where touches the pressure sensor. It's a pressure event. Sight, we've got RGB cameras. We're used to seeing cameras around, but there's also now the radar technology and also something called time of flight where we now get 3D capability built into that. So now these sensor technologies are replicating the human sight where it's not only a 2D image with colors, but now you can see depth to that and you can recognize depth to that. Hearing is another one. So microphones have become very, very sophisticated, very, very advanced, and they're being used to essentially replicate our hearing. Environmental sensors, such as detecting certain types of gases like CO2, that's like one of our noses, essentially. So you can detect that. So when you talk about sensors now, applying this to how we interact as human beings between one another, 
you can use now these sensor technologies from a machine perspective that now, as we interact in a certain way through COVID, we can use sensor technologies within machines to replicate that and basically work in an environment that's a lot safer. So, David, smart homes are already a huge market for various sensing technologies, right? What kind of sensors are you seeing in these types of systems in particular? Yeah, so it's exactly the same types of sensors. So microphones, gas sensing for environmental sensing, pressure sensors, radar technology, time of flight, and touch sense. So actually having a sensation of touching a device that not necessarily have real buttons, but it has the sensation of doing that. Where we're seeing the technologies being deployed is in IoT systems, a big market. So we talk about the smart home. One of those markets or a big marketplace is security. How do we enable a secure home? So security cameras, alarm systems. If you look at some of the regulations in California for building, for example, we're moving to green environments. How does that play out in terms of health within the home itself? Things like certain type of gases, we mentioned CO2, for example, that can be toxic in a work environment. It can create headaches. In a COVID situation, it can actually be a transmitter of COVID itself. Surveillance systems, we're used to cameras. And again, that uses vision technologies with these sensors. Comfort and convenience is another area where these sensors are used. Convenience of devices. So we already are used to interacting with devices through voice enablement. Rather than having to go over to a device, switch it on, you can have these devices continually listening to you. And then for convenience, you can just talk to, say, a smart speaker or something like that, and that can interact and enable all of your devices within the home. And health and wellness is a big one. More and more as the elderly population gets older and older, a lot of the elderly want to stay in their own environment. And we can use sensor technologies to just check their health conditions. And also, if you're looking at contact tracing, non-intrusively, you can use sensors already embedded into these types of applications, say, for example, security applications, and switch them into a mode of actually detecting the health of your body. They can detect things like heartbeat, breathing, and those types of things. When you put all of that together, it's interesting to see those applications because they fall into two or three buckets that they're really looking at things like human presence detection and localization. They're looking at vital sensing, and they're looking at air quality monitoring. Now, if you extrapolate all of those high-level use cases, Those are the type of things that you want to monitor for COVID. You want to monitor, you know, how are people keeping a safe distance? Where are people moving if you want to do contract tracing? Vital sensing. How are people's conditions in a COVID environment, a lockdown? And also air quality to stop the transmission of COVID viruses. So that all plays very nicely into sensors that have already been deployed. And then switching that into a mode of how do you control the work environment, the business environment in these pandemic times? So, David, let's start with that first point you mentioned, human presence detection and localization. What would that kind of solution look like? This could be as simple as the first indication when you enter a building. Let's say if we were to start at the front door. One of the things that we've looked at from a company-wide is that we want to get employees back to work. And how do we do that safely? If you imagine a large complex where people are coming back to work, the first thing they do is they probably enter the main lobby of a building of the workplace. Now, in the traditional mode, maybe everyone starts at nine o'clock and they're all rushing to go through the front door. Well, in the post-pandemic world is maybe that's not the right thing to do. Maybe what it is, is you detect individuals going through on an individual basis. And at the same time, as they enter the door, you can detect using sensor technologies, the distance of the next person So for example, as somebody enters the building, you may want to make sure that they enter and the next person doesn't enter until they've actually passed a safe distance, say six feet. And at which time the sensor can detect the person coming into the building. Once they've passed six feet, it allows the second person to enter. That can be something as simple like a LCD display that just shows like a traffic light system. Green, you can enter the building. Red, you can wait until the person has transitioned six feet. Now, the way we can do that, and clearly people are very sensitive to confidentiality. They don't like cameras watching them doing this thing. So one of the technologies that people are starting to deploy for that type of application is radar technology. And again, going back to our original discussion is now that that radar technology 
from a sensor perspective, has been shrunk down to literally the size of an integrated circuit. We can now embed that into the door frame itself. You can put it at the top of the door or the side of the door. Radar technology now has all those antennas, those things that you see sticking out on traditional radar devices. That's now all integrated into a technology we call antennas in package. So even in the size of that integrated circuit, the radar antennas are embedded in the package. They're completely hidden from the external world. And because radar can go through materials, you can hide the device in the door frame itself. So you don't actually see it, but it's still detecting the person entering. And you can create algorithms using the radar technology to get a human signature. And as that person enters, you can detect that person has entered the building. You can also detect the distance that they've traveled. And you can keep account of the number of people coming in the building. So having a safe number of people in the building, social distancing, and monitoring how they enter the building. So even that first entrant point, if you like, sensor technologies can play a big part. That makes sense. Now, David, specifically in terms of human presence detection, what kind of elements do we need for this type of application? There can be a number of sensors. The radar itself that we talked about earlier allows you to detect the presence of somebody. So once they're in the building, you may want to detect where they are. Say, for example, there's two or three people sitting at a table and somebody else comes to sit down at the table. The radar technology can also track where that person is going. And based on that, you can set an alarm system or you can set some indication that indicates, hey, you know, you're getting closer to a person. And then you can detect how many people should be sitting at that table. And if there's a safe distance as they're they're sitting in that table, that could also be used in conference rooms, keeping a safe distance between people. So a lot of that, a lot of the stuff that we look at today, as we approach somebody, we're trying to keep that, we're trying to say, okay, is that really, am I really six feet? But even today, I think the tendency is when you're communicating or when you're in a project meeting is you still want to get close to the person. So you can use sensor technologies just to make sure that you're not actually getting too close to that person in the work environment. There's no limit to what you can do with this. And what's interesting is, although it seems like a very complicated technology to deploy because you're having to do a lot of signal processing, interestingly enough, everything is moving to an AI world including the processing you would need on the device itself. So we're seeing more and more microcontrollers that have AI capabilities built into them. You've also got very cost-effective controllers that can control the radar devices and implement some really sophisticated algorithms. And so what that means also is that you have the capability now within a certain application, depending on what you want to do, depending how you want to control human occupancy, to actually get data in the situation and use that data to continually train and modify and continue to improve these sensor technologies. So it can only get better in the future. That's great. Now, David, how does COVID come into play here? This can also help us from the spread of COVID as well, right? That's correct. Environmental sensing is another area that has got a lot of technology and a lot of patents that's been applied to it. And traditional sensors, of, like most sensors, we talked about radar, If you look at environmental sensing, there's technologies that are out there for measuring carbon dioxide within a room. They're typically very large, what's called non-dispersive infrared light technologies, NDIR technologies, and you see them. They're big chunks of sensors on a wall or in a building. And people get put off by that. They look at that thing and say, you know, what's going on there? What's happening with that? There's other things attached to the wall that it looks ugly. Even on the, the sensor technology now, we can apply... MEMS technologies that have shrunk this down to a very, very small size. Even these environmental sensing technologies based on MEMS are actually becoming very, very small. So they can be embedded into existing equipment or they can be placed in a room where it's a very small device and it doesn't distract from what's going on within the room. There's a lot of research that's been published and you can Google this as well. Just type in CO2 direct correlation with COVID-19. And there's many, many use cases that have been developed that show that there's a direct correlation with the levels of CO2 in a room that correlate directly to the amount of transmission that's possible through COVID, through aerosols, for example. People breathing, if they're not wearing a mask, these get into the air and the amount of CO2 actually increases. More and more people breathing can be directly correlated to the amount of people in a room, the chances of transmission of COVID. And so based on that, There's been standards that are being developed or recommended. A certain number of particles per million of CO2 is a good level. 
And above or below that, or certainly above that, becomes dangerous. And it would be recommended then to either you know, reduce the number of people in a room because there's a likelihood that this could correlate directly to the chances of catching COVID, or alternatively, put some ventilation in the room, open a window, it will be a safer place to work. So those sensors can be used also in this COVID times as well to have a safe room, a safe environment to work in. That was really interesting, David. Now, smart ventilation and monitoring indoor air quality also comes into play here as well, right? That's correct. And a a good example of that is in California, within the building codes, Title 24, there is a section in there that talks about the safe limits of CO2 in a room. And it's fairly stringent. It talks about a safe environment where you don't get headaches, you don't get drowsiness, you don't feel dizzy or drowsy. It's probably about 1,000, if I remember it right, it's between 800 to 1,000 parts per million. Above that level, which is easy to get to with people talking and more people entering the room, it literally becomes a, a safety hazard. People feel physically tired. They feel drowsy. They feel nausea. And that can be built into... HVAC system. So there's a lot of companies now that are trying to meet these government requirements and building these sensor technologies into their HVAC systems, their HVAC control systems. And that would allow them to determine, okay, I'm reaching that safe limit, or I'm working under that safe limit, or otherwise I'm above that. It would be a good idea to turn on the ventilation or open a window, have some automation within the thermostat itself that could control that. Or use the thermostat to send a signal to a mobile phone saying, hey, you know, the CO2 levels have reached a level where it's probably dangerous to health. And it might be a good idea to open a window, open a door, turn on the ventilation system just for a healthier place to work. So, David, one thing that I have missed quite a lot these days is concerts. So could this kind of solution make that kind of experience safer as well? And what kind of sensors would you suggest using in this kind of situation? Yeah, that's a good one, actually, because now you're talking about going back to a really crowded space. So realistically, are we really going to get to a point where we can have social distancing at concerts, large events? But, you know, people are being vaccinated, so everybody wants to get back to a normal working environment. How could we control that? Many sensors can be applied to this. RF tagging. So, for example... You probably want to detect, you know, yes, somebody has been vaccinated, but what happens if, you know, after the event, where has that person within that concert area, where have they gone? So contact tracing, for example. So you can put RF tagging into a badge or a ticket so you can track the person. Cameras is a good one, obviously, to track people, who they are, who was there, trace that back to a badge or an ID that somebody has going into the concert and say, hey, this is a person that contracted or was a carrier. How many people were they close to? You could potentially use that. But again, one of the problems with cameras is it invades on people's privacy and there may be some issues with that. We talked about the smart entrance counter. So you can, to a certain extent, control. You want to have as many people in the concert venue as possible, but there may be a safe limit where, hey, you know, this is really dangerous if it gets above a certain limit. And that entrance device using radar, you can count the people coming in and out without having to use cameras where you physically take pictures of people for privacy reasons that may not be possible. Heart detection devices, controlled ventilation that we spoke about earlier. Another interesting technology is once you actually are in the concert, could you still detect a person without a camera? And one of the technologies that's interesting is we can leverage our 3D technologies or 3D technologies that are out there. And one of those technologies is time of flight. So essentially, it doesn't contain a picture of somebody. So you're not losing the identity of somebody. But it has enough information if you use the sensor to look at somebody's face to detect distinguishing features of that person. So without actually disclosing their ID, you can use the time of flight technology to also detect how somebody is looking, whether they're wearing a mask, whether they're not wearing a mask, these types of things. So that technology can also be very, very interesting in these environments. So a combination of all of these, I think there's a lot of sensors out there that can actually help us go back to big major events like concerts. Well, that is exciting. David, you also mentioned vital sensing earlier. So what kind of situations would you see this kind of sensing being powerful for? Powerful for health and monitoring in a normal environment. And we're certainly seeing applications for that being deployed today. People are locked down. They're in their environments. How do they stay fit? We're seeing a rise of exercise machines. We're seeing a rise of home gyms, essentially, 
picking up where those health facilities are not available. So we can actually use embedded sensor technologies that non-obtrusively would measure things like heartbeat, measure things like body temperature. Those can all be tracked and put into an app, for example, and then from that you can detect a person's health. Even at night, there's more and more sleep monitoring devices. So you can have a smart speaker device and within that you're using sensor technologies and you can leverage those sensor technologies that were purposed for other applications, but then switch them into a use case that switches to actually monitoring your breathing conditions, your heart rate, snoring, those types of things, and give you a readout in the morning, you know, how well did you sleep? What's your snoring? How many times did you snore? Which can be directly correlated to health reasons and certainly would benefit your partner, for example, if you could reduce that going forward. That health monitoring capabilities can also be done with these more advanced sensors. And again, the fact that they are non-intrusive, they're embedded in existing equipment, means that they're not something that you have to physically drag out, put on your body, et cetera. It's all done automatically for you. And then you can get results, for example, through your cell phone, through an app, for example. In a COVID environment, you know, how does that affect preconditioned people that have some sort of lung ailment today? You know, how is that changing over time? You can have these sensors just continually monitoring people and saying, hey, it might be a good idea based on the statistics that we're getting back to just get checked out for COVID and do a COVID test. Those types of things can help out. Excellent. Now, David, with a lot of companies encouraging employees to come back into the office these days, it seems like this kind of technology could also be used within our office environments as well. Absolutely correct. Yes. And one of the things that we talked about a number of applications detecting people, human presence. But one of the other things that's very interesting is what about touching surfaces? We've heard about coming back to the office and it might be a a hybrid model where people come in only a few days. I've even heard, and even our own company is talking about this, is that offices are now shared. We probably need a smaller space if we're working in a hybrid model. And what about sharing cubes? What about sharing desks? What about sharing offices? These are all things that I think a lot of people are talking about coming back to the working environment. So one of the things that becomes prevalent there is, okay, now we talked about keeping social distancing, wearing masks, limiting the number of people coming into a room. But what happens when you're sitting at your desk and you're touching that environment that may have been touched by other people? You know, how do we control that? What sort of technologies could we use? And what we're seeing now is a human interface technology that's evolving where You can almost move now to a solution where you don't need to touch the product. You can basically hover your hand over and use gestures as opposed to physically touching keys on a keyboard, for example. And when you start thinking about an environment where you don't need to touch devices, you can apply this to vending machines. You can apply this to the key entry system. Normally, you would swipe a card. Maybe you swipe your hand across and the the sensors have the capabilities to detect your particular hand motion. Or we've even used applications with time of flight that you can program the time of flight to recognize vein patterns in your hand. It's that sensitive. So everybody's got a different vein structure by swiping their hand or putting their hand in front of a device. It recognizes the particular vein pattern in your hand and that opens a door automatically for you. So you're getting to the point where you don't need to touch a lot of these devices going into that office environment. And here you can start seeing a number of sensors. We talked about radar, we talked about time of flight technologies. You can use ultrasonic. So we have microphone technologies that detect voice in the hearing range, which is 20 to 20,000 kilohertz. But if you go above that, which is called ultrasound, we can't hear it, but the sensors can still operate in the, say, the 30 to 40 kilohertz range, which the human ear can't hear. But what that's doing is it's generating or it's recognizing sounds in the ultrasonic frequency band. And those gesture movements can be picked up by a microphone and detected. And that microphone traditionally is being used for just picking up sound that we can audibly hear. So again, it's an area where these sensors were developed and designed for one particular use case, but they can now be applied to different use cases. So depending on the sensor, going into that touch-free environment depends on the distance that you can do that touch-free. Radar would allow you to monitor things and open doors at a very large distance, even up to 10 meters, for example, as you're approaching, it could start opening a door automatically. Some of the smaller sensors, like a microphone, that would be very close proximity. So you approach a laptop, and as you approach a laptop, it switches a laptop on those types of applications. So yeah, that's another area where we're seeing a lot of advancement and a lot of thought going into 
the human machine interface of machines moving forward. Part of it is coming from how do we get back to a safe working environment in these post pandemic days? Now, David, this kind of touchless interaction could be even more widespread outside of the office as well, right? That's right. You can see this in interfacing with other machines. If you go to the mall, for example, you can see one of the first things you come to is probably a map of the mall. Where do I find the shop? So instead of touching the machine to get the details, you can approach it and it would come up. You could activate it with your voice. You know, a particular shop that you want to access picks up your voice patterns. You interact via voice or you interact via gestures to particular machines. And then you can extrapolate that to other areas, restaurants, vending machines or door entry systems, and the list goes on and on. This is something that we see a lot of innovation taking place now. Okay, so David, of all of the sensing technologies we've talked about today, where do you see these kind of solutions headed in the future and which ones are going to stick around? I think a lot of them are going to stick around, actually. If you go back to the entrance counter, that's an easy one to implement. Now you can embed these sensor technologies in the entrance of a building. You've got a quick mechanism to determine how many people are in the building, et cetera. Don't see that going away. That's not a one-off. That's something that's going to stick around. Environmental and health sensing, just working in a safe environment, just even at home. You know, if you think about now, we're all stuck in front of a terminal. We're feeling drowsy. A lot of that could be because the CO2 levels are rising in a room. And if it's not detected, the person is non productive or is drowsy during the day. And a simple thing like having a detection mechanism where, hey, just open a window and you'll feel the benefits of that. That's not going to go away. And it's not going to go away now that even the government is starting to regulate this in home environments through their building codes, having safe environmental places to work. Touchless, we touched on that. You know, it's nice to have everything sanitized, but, you know, are you really going to do that constantly on on every surface every time? So the idea of a non-touch human machine interface so that you can activate your computer just with gestures or voice activation, take that to the next level. If you go back to the Star Trek days, maybe there's a holographic image there that replicates the computer and you're interacting with a holographic image a 3D or an AR, VR type user interface. These are not things that are that far from the future, maybe with some wearable devices, such that you're in a virtual world interacting with your machines. You're not physically touching them. So again, for safety reasons, there are technologies now that are being developed that's going to enable that. So I think it's an exciting future going forward. And certainly there's a lot of apprehension about going back to work, but with these technologies, and I think what's going to be coming over the next few years, I think it's going to be a very cool place to go back to work. Excellent. I'm looking forward to that. I think that's all I have time for today. Thank you so much for joining me. This was super cool. You're welcome. For Chalk Talks, I'm Amelia Dalton from eejournal.com. For more Chalk Talks, check out the Chalk Talks section of EE Journal. You can't miss it. It's right across the top. Or head on over to YouTube, youtube.com slash eejournal.